Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. Isaiah chapter 5 will be our text this evening. We'll begin our reading tonight in see, verse 11. Reverend Lyman Beecher was a Presbyterian minister who spent his career in the churches of Connecticut and in the Northeast, in New York, came here for a while, worked as the president of Lane Theological Seminary here in Cincinnati. Well, then at that time it was in Walnut Hills. Was here for 16 years, I think, and moved back to the Northeast. He was, as I said, the patron of the temperance movement, but he was also a patron of the abolitionist movement, a great influencer in that is, I think if Reverend Beecher were here tonight, he would tell us that the temperance movement and the movement to free the slaves were really one and the same heartbeat. As a matter of fact, from the time that Reverend Beecher began preaching about temperance, all the way up through the Civil War and afterwards, the sentiment was especially after the Civil War, now that we have ended slavery in America, it's time to end alcohol. And they were they really kind of ran together. You don't hear a lot of people talk about that, but they they did, especially amongst Christians. The Christian church was dead set against both, not in every place, of course, but overall it was the Christian movement that really saw temperance and the fruition of temperance happen in the Prohibition Amendment, and it was the Christian church in its efforts to free slavery that initiated the movement towards uh, the release of the slaves, of course, ended in a, a bloody civil war, but never the intention. So let me read to you again from the nature and occasion of intemperance, Reverend Beecher's um, flagship sermon, 1828. He said, No sin has fewer apologies than intemperance. The suffrage of the world is against it, and yet there is no sin so naked in its character and whose commencement and progress is indicated by so many signs concerning which there is among mankind such profound ignorance. All reprobate drunkenness, and yet not one of the thousands who fall into it dreams of danger when he enters the way that leads to it. The soldier approaching the deadly breach and seeing rank after rank of those who precede him swept away hesitates sometimes and recoils from death. But men behold the effects upon others of going in given courses. They see them begin, advance, and end in confirmed intemperance and unappalled rush heedlessly upon the same ruin. Well, isn't that the truth? In Isaiah chapter 5 I have you turn tonight to the the great gospeler Isaiah in the Old Testament. We have more of Isaiah in the New Testament than any other book of the Old Testament. And while it's quoted more often than any other book of the Old Testament, it's also inferred more often than any, any other book of the Old Testament. And I won't read it tonight, but if you want to read the Song of the Vineyard there in chapter 5 beginning in verse 1, very interesting. And I think that perhaps you'll see some correlation between the song of the vineyard here in Isaiah 5 and Jesus' parable of the vineyard in the Gospels. But we're going to look at chapter 5, verse 11, and it begins with a woe. And any time you have a passage beginning with a woe, it's not a good thing. Let's read now verse 11. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the harp and the viol and the uh, tabre and the pipe and wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst." Therefore hell hath enlarged herself, and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. 
And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. And I think that is, frankly, the greatest threat, the greatest sorrow, actually, is how many believers are not temperate. How much this is embraced by those who claim Christ. It's, uh, it's, for me, it's very disturbing because I think that holiness has a standard, and this is, one of those, this is one of those score marks on the standard of holiness is temperance. And when I see believers behaving intemperately, it really bothers me. And I think for many, it's, that is the, that's the thing that d- disturbs us the most and causes us the sorrow the most is when we see it within the church. And he addresses that right here. I think what we have here in the beginning of verse 11, not only do we have a woe, which is pronounced by Isaiah, and we find in Isaiah several times he uses the woe uh, to pronounce judgment. And he's talking to Israel, so this is God's people that he's speaking to here. But we have what I've entitled the religion of alcohol. Notice verse 11. Woe to them that rise up early in the morning. Now, if you just stopped right there, you're wondering to yourself, what happens early in the morning? Well, we know that this is the devotion, and it's stated in several ways when we talk about the walk of faith, that the early morning time is a time for prayer. In the temple that Isaiah may have been looking at while he was pinning this piece, it was a time for sacrifice and for prayer and for consecration. Every morning there was a sacrifice. Every morning there was a prayer time. Morning time and evening time was the time to seek the Lord. And so when he says, woe to them that rise up early, if you just stop there, you would think, wait a minute, it's good to rise up early because that's a part of our devotion. That's the time when we seek the Lord is first thing in the morning. But notice the next phrase, that they may follow strong drink. Again, We have our language here for strong, intoxicating beverage. That's the word strong drink. They're following not the Lord, but they're following strong drink. You see the see suddenly this see the perverse image that is being created here by Isaiah. And Isaiah, just like what we had the image created this morning for us in the Proverbs, we have with Isaiah another great writer who is able to draw these beautiful pictures for us with words. So rising up early in the morning, not to follow the Lord, but to follow something completely perverse, strong, intoxicating drink. Notice, for, notice the next phrase, that continue until night. Now, wait a minute, what happens in the evening? The evening is another time for sacrifice and for prayer. So you have the morning and then you have the evening. And so from morning until evening, prayer begins here. Prayer begins, or prayer ends here. So the day is framed by prayer and sacrifice for the Jewish believer. And in the middle is the words following after the Lord should be engraven in gold letters across this arch of the day. Beginning with prayer, ending with prayer, following the Lord. That should be the banner of every day's devotion. But for the religion of alcohol, it begins in the morning with strong drink. It ends in the evening with strong drink, and the banner over the day is following after strong drink. And then the very last phrase there, till wine inflame them. What are we doing when we seek the Lord? We begin in the morning, and we follow the Lord through the day, and we end in the evening with prayer. We're seeking the filling of the Spirit of God in our day. Here, we're asking wine to inflame us, to do something with our passions, to make us something beyond our nature. And, of course, we know how that happens. And this morning's message, when I translated that strong drink, remember it says strong drink is raging, and that meant loud, it's boisterous, it's noisy, it's roaring, it's growling. That's the idea. Well, here we have another good word to describe the result of drunkenness inflamed. So we have the devotion of alcohol as it relates to its religion. And then we have 
the festival of alcohol. Notice there in verse 12. The harp, the viol, the tabret, the pipe, and wine are in their feasts. Now, wait a minute. Doesn't the Jewish religion have feast days? Aren't there days when we go to the temple and to the tabernacle and we celebrate the Lord in feasts and in harvest time and in uh, atonement and in Passover and in Pentecost? Aren't all those feast times when we go and prepare or appear before the Lord? Well, see now the religion of alcohol is a feast time too. And here are the members of the feasts. The harp, the viol, the tabaret, the pipe. I have no problem with any of those instruments. I love them all. As someone who has instrument acquisition syndrome, I would like to meet all of them. But notice the last guest at the feast, wine, because this is a part of their religion. You can't really worship at the altar of drunkenness unless you have the feast days. And there are many among us today as well. There are certain times when we have our feast days, such as New Year's Eve. That's a feast day for the alcohol, uh, for the religion of alcohol. You know, there are other feast days, which we can mention, Fourth of July, Labor Day, so forth, when we want to drink and forget. So the religion of alcohol is, is, quite, uh, is quite wonderfully or beautifully described here. But I want you to notice the second half of verse 12. This is the sad part. A devotion to wine and strong drink is not what the Lord calls us to. Notice, but, there in verse 12, they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. What is the work of the Lord? And in Psalm 92, he talks about the work, the works of the Lord's hands in creation and the governance of the universe. But not only that, let me turn back there real quick. To the Psalter. He also mentions the goodness of God to the individual there in Psalm 92. He says there in verse 10, My horn shalt thou exalt. Like the horn of a unicorn, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on my enemies. My ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree, and he shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. This is also a part of the works of God. Not only the works of God in creation, which we can see the heavens being the works of his hands, but also the works in us, the flourishing, the anointing, see the exalting. He exalts us, he anoints us, he allows us to see and hear the, our desire upon our enemies, He makes us to flourish. He makes us to grow. He plants us in the house of the Lord so that we continue to flourish and continue to grow and bring forth, in verse 14 there in Psalm 92, fruit in old age. That's the work of the Lord in our life. And so when Isaiah says, and I'm sure Isaiah knew Psalm 92, when he says here in verse 12, they regard not the work of the Lord, I just wonder if he wasn't thinking about Of course, I'm thinking about Psalm 92 because I just studied it last week. But I wonder if he wasn't also thinking about 92 or other psalms like that or other verses like that that describe the wonderful work of God. What are we to be fixed on? You see, the the person who's a, a devotee of alcohol is fixed on the experience. He's fixed on being inflamed. He's fixed on following it all day long. He fi- he's fixed on beginning his day and ending his day with a drink. He's fixed on the feast times when he can indulge himself in the festivals of alcohol. But what are we to be fixed on? We're to be fixed on the work of the Lord, regarding his work in the world and in us, and the operation of his hands. That is, seeing the Lord manifest in our life day by day. And how often we can say to ourselves, oh, that was, that was the Lord that did that. That was the Lord who opened that opportunity. That was the Lord who blessed me with that gift or that goodness. Well, he goes on there in verse 13. And in this section, I, I entitled this the ultimate end for alcohol. 
You see, every religion has its 